All right, we're good. Welcome to another Scripture Roundtable from the Interpreter Foundation. We're pleased to have you with us. Um, we're going to be discussing today uh, the 17th lesson of the Gospel Doctrine Manual related to the Doctrine and Covenants in Church History. And uh, with me, uh, starting at the left of the screen, I have Ben McGuire. And then next to him, Bryce Haymond, who may be largely mute. He's our, he's our tech man or our producer, I suppose, uh, but he has a bad cold. And so he's decided to uh, forego speaking as much as he can until we say things that are so outrageous that he simply <laughs> can't, can't sit by any longer in silence. Um, I am Dan Peterson, and on my right, always on my right, it seems, is Mike Parker. Uh, and so uh, we'll be discussing today uh, concepts related to fasting and, and uh, tithes. And it's appropriate, I think, to begin the discussion by simply alluding to the fact that there are, these are extensively discussed, really, in, in, the, uh, in the scriptures uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. For example, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 58, classic passage, really, uh, beginning with verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the, band of, the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then, presumably if you live this kind of a fast, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, the glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Thou shalt call, then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking of vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. So there you have um, the idea of a fast. Of course, it's not merely going without food. It's, there's, there are questions of justice and helping the poor and so on involved, but also promises of, uh, of material blessing in exchange for a fast, uh, for a fast, for going uh, material blessings will actually bring you more. Um, the New Testament has uh, has quite a bit to say about fasting too. Uh, one notable example is in Matthew six, um, where you have um, you have this passage in verses sixteen through eighteen of Matthew six. How should you behave when you're fasting? Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites, of a sad countenance. They disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, in the sense that the people seeing them praise them for their righteousness. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear un not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, uh, the blessing of reward coming upon self-denial. Um, but the idea is we're not supposed to do it for outward show. Finally, on the question of tithing, the classic passage that I'll have done with this sort of uh, biblical survey is, uh, is from uh, the book of Malachi. We all know this passage from uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Now meat here meaning simply food. And prove me now herewith, that is, test me. See if I'm keeping my word. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven, and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before her time to the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, 
for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Or again, by denying yourself, you actually reap material blessings in the conception of both the Old and the New Testaments. Um, and I will just say before, uh, before we pass on into, uh, into 19th century church history as a background for our discussion, that there are many people who can testify of that. I'm not sure that it's an absolute uh, law that, you know, invest 10 cents of fasting, get a dollar in reward. It doesn't work quite so crudely. If that were true, then everybody would do it. There'd be no faith involved. But I've heard many testimonies, including a very surprised one from my own father, who joined the church late in life. Um, actually, uh, I was able to baptize him the night I was set apart as a missionary. But he, he commented uh, later on that, one thing he'd worried about was the paying of tithing. He had uh, he'd done fairly well in business, but to suddenly take a 10% pay cut um, was was a shock. But he did it, and to his astonishment, and he could never quite figure out why, his business suddenly took off. And he actually attributed that to the payment of tithes. Now, again, I don't want to make that a prediction. I don't say, hey, look, if you're suffering right now, go out and pay more offerings. Send your love gifts to me. I will personally pray over every one of them. And you know, and then you'll be rich. Um, that I think is is crude and false. But that the Lord will bless us uh, if we sacrifice in His cause, I think, is a clear teaching of Scripture. Um, but now we come to the 19th century context of the chapters in the Doctrine and Covenants that we're going to be talking about. Ben, I think you had something you wanted to say about that. Well, you know, when we when we talk about <clears throat> Scripture, the Doctrine and Covenants, we often talk about the questions, right, that that trigger these revelations. Uh, the issues that lead up to this really start uh, in 1837. And uh, up, until, up until late 1837, the church had been doing fairly well. There was some persecution going on, but uh, they were in Ohio. Um, the, the church was thriving. We had the, uh, the Kirtland bank uh, that had been started up and uh, as part of the uh, the financial collapse at the end of 1837 it went uh, and the church lost a great deal of their of their wealth and uh, and a lot of incomes as they were driven out uh, by the beginning of 1838 Joseph is in Zion's camp uh, in Missouri uh, and they're being pushed around some in Missouri at this point too, right? They're actually not going to stay here very long. They're going to head almost immediately to Nauvoo. Um, but uh, without without the finances that Joseph had, he was um, he he had essentially been paying for much of the administrative functions of the church, as scribes, uh, the, the other you know, the other work that needs to be done that they have, you, you have to hire people for. Uh, he'd been doing a lot of this out of his own pocket, both he and Sidney Rigdon. And so in, in May of 1838, uh, Joseph and Sidney went to the, uh, the high council there in, in Zion's camp and, and asked for a salary so that they could then use this money to uh, not only to take care of their own needs, but to pay for, for these uh, administrative functions so that he could continue to, to employ a scribe and uh, the assistants that he used. And the High Council immediately granted him his request. And then uh, the next week, over the, uh, uh, the, anxious, the anxiety of several members of the church, they rescinded the offer. And, you know, the, the reason why they took it back was because there was a lot of angst over this idea of having a paid ministry. Um, but I think at this point, uh, there's this real question of how the church has continued to grow. It's gotten fairly large at this point, um, much larger than just a few families, right, that we had started with uh, several years earlier. The question comes up, how do we pay for uh, these administrative functions of the church, right? If every time we go to build a building like we did in Kirtland, are we going to need to rely on the goodwill of the members at that time and the donations of of uh, what they can provide, right? And we all know the story of the good China being used uh, there. Um, so uh, I think it, that that uh, there's no coincidence that we have these questions about finances, especially in light of the church being driven away from most of their property and their financial security in Kirtland. Uh, to in May to in July, we receive these these revelations that start to lay out. Uh, 
uh, to remind the church, right? Because as 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 you pointed out, Dan, we we already have these ideas in Scripture about tithing and offerings uh, as a way that the Lord takes care of the poor and the needy and and the needs of uh, of His church. Uh, so the Lord reminds the saints in these two sections that we're going to be looking at in the next little bit about this idea uh, of the tithes and offerings and uh, how the Lord expects for that to come so that there, there's an even burden placed on all the members of the church uh, that then can be used to take care of these needs. Great. Yeah, I think it's really important. We often don't understand um, you know, how small and how poor the church was in, in those days. and. Uh, and how difficult it was. We have now a flourishing, well-organized financial institution, the corporation of the president, so on and so forth, you know. But in those days, uh, there was no idea of a corporation, for one thing, as I understand it. And uh, and so the question was, who pays for what? I mean, the church can't run without some money. It's not a mercenary institution, but but there are things that cost, and um, and they've got to be taken care of, and how will that be done? And this is all still being invented uh, Things that we assume as always having been there weren't there, weren't clearly understood. And, and you know, they, they had had a couple of church buildings at this point, right? In particular, we had the temple in Kirtland, but we're about to move into the Nauvoo where we suddenly start building churches. Yeah. Really for the first time uh, beyond this idea of a house of prayer, right? Uh, and we have multiple congregations that are going to be springing up in this need for really massive growth and development. And had they continued the way they were, it, it simply wouldn't have worked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike, do you have anything you want to add to that? Or we'll move on then to section 119. But b before we do that, if I may, I, there's one little parenthetic thing that I want to throw in, because I don't think we'll be talking about fasting very much, very much more. Um, maybe we will. But uh, there's a passage that's included in the lesson material in section 59, the Doctrine and Covenants that uh, is worth at least a mention. This whole lesson, we were joking before we went on air, you can read all the scriptures in it in about five minutes. So, Gospel Doctrine class members, there is no excuse for coming to your Gospel Doctrine class without having read the lesson material for this lesson. Be warned. Um, but here's, here's one passage. Um, section 59, verses 13 and 14 and 21. And on this day, speaking of the Sabbath day, thou shalt do none other thing, only let thy food be prepared with singleness of heart, that thy fasting may be perfect, or in other words, that thy joy may be full. Verily, this is fasting and prayer, or in other words, rejoicing in prayer. Now, I have to confess, there have been days when fasting has not struck me as synonymous with rejoicing. Just really hungry, especially when I was younger and trying to grasp the principle of, uh, of the fast. But this is very interesting language. Um, and even preparing the food that you do eat on the Sabbath day with singleness of, of purpose, singleness of heart. Um, and then someone asked me just the other day, is there a scriptural mandate for saying grace at meals? Oddly enough, I really couldn't think of one. I mean, it's done at, at <laughs> Passover, you know, that sort of thing. Prayers are offered, the hymns are sung. Um, but here's one that will serve in a way. It's talking about food and eating and so on. And then it says, In nothing doth man offend God, verse 21. Or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments. So it seems to me, in the context of eating, that if his wrath is kindled against those who don't confess his hand in all things, saying a prayer might be, um, might be a really wise thing to do. Uh, offer a little thanks. Uh, before you start gorging yourself, um, because the Lord is asking us to thank Him. And, you know, we may think, well, but I raised this food, or I've earned the money to buy it. Uh, but, you know, if the weather were suddenly to change and our crops were to fail, life would change very radically for us. We're dependent on things that are far beyond our power. Uh, so it still behooves us, even in a high tech age, it seems to me, to be grateful. Um, so, Mike. What, what was that famous prayer from Bart Simpson? Uh, Dear God, we earned the money and bought all this food ourselves. Thanks for nothing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, then there's the joke about uh, like you know, the <laughs> way the Lord has blessed us. You know, uh, uh, look at all these crops and so on. And says, yeah, well, uh, the farmer says, yeah, you should have seen the field out here when it was just him managing it alone. <laughs> you know? Well, and, and the, one, the one I like is a little boy who's at his friend's house, and they'd say a prayer over the food. 
and he, he looks like he doesn't know what to do. And his friend says, don't you pray over the food? And he says, well, no. He says, my mom's a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a few comments I wanted to make on this. First, going uh, back to Ben's comments a minute ago, there's kind of a persistent uh, myth in the church that uh, consecration or, or the United Order, which is not the same as consecration, it was an element or, or an attempt to, to bring consecration into effect, uh, failed because people weren't willing to live it. And that's not exactly true. There were some people who were not, but by and large, the saints were honestly trying to fulfill the Lord's commandments, and there were some economic issues that really prevented them. Uh, you had a lot of people who were coming in who didn't, first of all, have anything to consecrate in the first place, which makes it really tough to live in the law of consecration when you've only got a handful of people who have anything to start with. Uh, and then uh, Ben already mentioned the the economic collapse, the panic of uh, uh, 1837 and 38, where the, the church lost everything. And then, of course, they had to move out of Kirtland. And so they lost, uh, well, they had already lost their lands in Jackson County, which they had sunk a lot of money into to buying. And then to lose everything they had in Kirtland, including the temple, uh, there just wasn't anything left to consecrate. And so uh, what we're going to get to in a minute with Section 119 is kind of a reset button. Uh, and we're going to see that with verse 1. I did want to mention something about fasting, though. That that passage in 59 verse 13 uh, always strikes me as odd because it's talking about not fasting in the sense that we think of it, which is abstaining from food. It's talking about fasting in preparing food and in eating food. Uh, now, I did look into this a little bit, and I really can't find any reason why Joseph would use that particular word in there. If you look at, at Webster's 1828 dictionary, it very simply says fasting is abstaining from food. It doesn't give any alternative uh, definitions. And it seems that Joseph is, is using the word fasting here, and he was not opposed to doing this sort of thing, kind of, kind of coming up with creative uses for, for biblical language. Fasting to mean, um, well, rejoicing is how it's defined in verse 14 but in just approaching God in humility and in gratitude and in thankfulness. And we can do that a number of different ways. One of them is the traditional fast, which is to abstain from two meals or uh, 24 hours or however you intend to interpret it. Uh, but fasting can also mean to approach the meal that you do eat with a, a sense of humility and a sense of gratitude and a sense of, of reverential awe for God and all that He's that He has given us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That brings us to the traditional Latter Day Saint prayer, and, and we do have lots of little phrases that we like to use in our prayers. And quite often, you hear, "Please bless this food, that it will uh, nourish and strengthen our bodies," and so forth. And you know, I really don't find any scriptural justification for that, and I don't think that God is changing the chemical makeup right. of of the pizza and donuts that you're about to have yeah. to, to make them non-fattening. Uh, <laughs> So what I've tried to teach my children is is it's not necessary to use those, but just to be grateful. Just say, we are thankful for this food, and we recognize that without thy help, Father, we would not have the things that we have, and we're grateful to you. Yeah, I'm assuming, I haven't checked, uh, I should have checked, but the thought just occurred to me that, that the, the grace in the English expression, say grace, is probably related not to grace in the sense of unmerited gift, but but more grace in the sense of gracias, you know, uh, gratitude. You express mm. gratitude for food, um, for, for the graciousness, I suppose, of God. But, uh, but we say grace in the sense that we say thank you. Um, mm. And that is scripturally mandated, I think. But I, I've, I agree with your point, Mike. I've, I've always thought it was, um, it was expecting a little much of the Lord, some sort of transubstantiation or something, when you prepare a meal that is... <laughs> really fundamentally unhealthy and then ask the Lord to bless it that it'll somehow the chemistry will be altered so that instead of uh, fats and sugars it'll be proteins and, and <laughs> high fiber. Um, he's just not likely to do that. Um, so anyway. We, um, we do have our, our vain repetitions. Yes. yes so the, we other, do. the other one that I laugh about is take us home in safety. The entire two blocks that we have to go from church where there are <laughs> crocodiles and sharks and so forth between here and there. <laughs> Although uh, when when my sons were first getting their driver's licenses, I thought that that was probably <laughs> probably good advice. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Well, um, if you don't mind, I have some I have some notes. Our, our mute partner there, uh, <laughs> Bryce Heyman, prepared some notes that he was going to use for his discussion, but he's not afraid that his or I mean he's afraid that his voice won't be up to it. Uh, so I'm going to. It's not. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do my best to uh, to go through these, and if at any point I misrepresent the uh, the points he was trying to make, he can jump in there and and uh, correct me. But uh, uh, he said that uh, in the notes that he sent me that uh, Doctrine and Covenants 119, which is where we're going to turn our attention now, is an important section to study carefully if we're to properly understand it. And then he quotes Stephen Harper, who's a, uh, a historian, an LDS historian. Uh, and one of the editors on the Joseph Smith Papers project, uh, Professor Harper says that this section of the Doctrine and Covenants is perhaps the most misunderstood revelation of the prophet Joseph Smith. And, you know, that's kind of surprising because it's only a few verses long. I mean, how hard can it be? Um, how could we possibly misunderstand it? Uh, but the reason is that we don't often understand the, the context of the revelation. We 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 take it out of its historical context and its scriptural context. Uh, and one important point to understand is that the law of consecration had already been given to the saints in 1831. That's fully seven years prior to this. It's already been mentioned. Uh, and it taught in brief that the saints were to offer up uh, or to consecrate all of their possessions to the Lord, that is to his church. And then the Lord via the bishop of the church, there was only one in that day, um, would give a stewardship back to each member. That is, the church didn't keep all the property, but it kind of uh, equalized holdings and gave back stewardships to people that they were to manage. And then thereafter, they were accountable to the Lord for their stewardship. Um, uh, they were supposed to be amply supplied in their needs, but any surplus that was generated by their activity and their stewardship was to be returned to the bishop to administer to the poor and the needy. That's from Doctrine and Covenants uh, 42. Um, and um, the leaders of the church taught this uh, taught this principle, although you know there was some mixture of human cussedness and uh, economic ad adversity, uh, persecution, all sorts of things that prevented the law from from really working. Uh, by 1837, we've already mentioned this. There was an economic depression that had struck most of the country, and the saints suffered from it too. They weren't spared, and. Uh, uh, Bishop uh, Whitney of the church proposed that the saints be tithed, a voluntary offering, beyond what they had already consecrated. And Joseph Smith recognized the church needed more revenue. It had to have more money to accomplish its purposes, including building a temple. Um, so at that point, Joseph prays, O Lord, show unto thy servants how much thou requirest of the properties of thy people for a tithe. And Doctrine and Covenants 119 is the revelation that's given an answer to that uh, prayer. Um, so, if you read the scriptures carefully, uh, you find that the Lord might be revealing something a little different than what we expect. Section 119 begins um, with a direct reiteration of the law of consecration that had already been given in section 42 and in 54. Um, it says, Verily thus saith the Lord, I require all their surplus property, to be put into the hands of the bishop of my church in Zion. Um, then verse 2 notices, uh, makes note of the purposes of the, uh, of the law of consecration, which are the same purposes that it always had, for the building of mine house, for the laying of the foundation of Zion, and for the priesthood, and for the deaths of the presidency of my church. Uh, verse 3 then says, And this shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. Um, the beginning of the tithing of my people. I'm not going to emphasize that word. Uh, this is the first of the three uses of the word tithing or tithe in the section. What did it refer to? Um, well, Steve Harper, again the historian, notes in his commentary on the DNC that all of the references to tithing uh, refer to the voluntary offering of surplus. In verse 4 it says, And after that those who have thus been tithed shall pay one-tenth of all their interest annually, and this shall be a standing law unto them forever, for my holy priesthood, saith the Lord. Um, this is, um, according to Harper, this is not a lesser law to be uh, replaced at some future point, but this is a standing law unto them forever, and applicable to all saints everywhere. Um, so, tithing is a continuation of, uh, in, in, in Bryce Heyman's view and Steve Harper's view, a uh, continuation of and part of, not 
something or, that replaces the law of consecration, but something is part of it. Um, saints are still to offer up their surpluses to the bishop, uh, and so on. And um, in fact, you could argue that we still live under the law of consecration. Many of us have made covenants to that effect. Um, and here's a passage from um, Marion G. Romney. Um, at that point, a, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, later a, a counselor, second and then first counselor in the first presidency of the church. And he said that we should live strictly by the principles of the United Order, in other words, the law of consecration, insofar as they are embraced in present church practices, such as the fast offering, tithing, and welfare activities. Through these practices, we could, as individuals, if we wish to do so, implement in our own lives all the basic principles of the United Order, or in other words, the law of consecration. What prohibits us from giving as much in fast offerings as we would have given in surpluses? Nothing but our own limitations. So it's always struck me, you know, that people have asked me sometimes, um, when is the church going to reinstitute the law of consecration? Well, it's never actually done away with it. It's, it's always been there. And I suppose that when the church comes back under the, fully under the law of consecration, it will be because the members have decided to do it, not because there's some new decree. Maybe there will be, maybe there won't, but none is really needed. Um, so one thing I want to stress, and I know that, uh, that Brother Parker, uh, on my right in the screen will agree with this, uh, is that the law of consecration was a voluntary law. And that's crucial. That's really important. Um, it is not a coercive law. Sometimes I run into people who can't seem to distinguish it from, say, a form of uh, state-imposed socialism or something like that. But it's not the same thing. Uh, it's a voluntary rule. Uh, and we still have that, that right to voluntarily contribute or not. And the Doctrine and Covenants includes sections, I, I can't remember the passage off the top of my head, but it includes instructions on how to get out. If you yep. want out of consecration, what do you do? You, you can take with you everything that you have that has been deeded to you. You don't get back what you put into the bishop's storehouse. Right. But right. If whatever you have on your property that's in your hands, you can take it with you, and you're right. out, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I want to jump in here just a moment, too, and that is, is that we look at this, and to, they actually were looking forward to this kind of a situation, the saints. Um, one of the things that I was reading about this week uh, was some of the early history of Sidney Rigdon, who uh, in 1821 was a popular Baptist preacher who caught the eye of uh, Campbell, who was leading a new restorationist movement, uh, and convinced him to join his church. And uh, they were together for several years. Um, Sidney Rigdon's biggest challenge with, with Campbell's religion was is, uh, that Campbell didn't want to experiment with this economic situation, this kind of law of consecration that Sidney Rigdon read about in the New Testament. And uh, when he met Joseph Smith and found the Book of Mormon uh, and read it and received his witness, he saw this as a, uh, more as a chance to, to explore that, that return to that primitive religion, right, to this New Testament sort of ideal. And so this is what we're seeing playing out. The saints wanted uh, this kind of uh, this kind of expectation uh, and situation. They wanted to live the law of consecration. Uh, they wanted to try this united order. It didn't fail because they didn't want to, or they had problems that that failed because that they went into it as as uh, as Mike was saying, so poorly prepared for it. Uh, in general, they were going to have trouble no matter what they did. Yeah, yeah. It raises interesting issues for the church today because, um, you know, I think uh, most Latter-day Saints are probably roughly middle in the United States, roughly middle class, upper middle class, somewhere in that range. We have some very rich, we have some quite poor, but by and large, uh, there are not radical uh, distinctions in wealth among among ordinary mainstream members of the church. But it changes dramatically when you go international. Uh, and then you see that there are people living in really wretched conditions in uh, uh, who are faithful, active members of the church. You know, I, I've, I've heard of bishops, for example, who have to choose which members of their family get to go with them to church because they can't afford the bus fare uh, to bring all of the family every week and that sort of thing. Uh, active members of the church, including bishops who are living effectively in cardboard boxes in, in slums in Lima, Peru, and things like that. 
So the question of, of wealth and poverty within the church is still an acute one. Um, and I have to say, I think there are things that the church has done very much in the spirit of the law of consecration or the United Order, like, uh, for example, the Perpetual Education Fund. I remember the announcement of that. To me, it was one of the most emotional moments I've ever had in a general conference. I mean, it ranks up there with with um, oh, the announcement of the Nauvoo Temple reconstruction, things like that, where you just think, wow, this is, this is a really big thing. This is really important because... Um, you know, the fact that some of us are living in, by historical standards, almost obscene comfort, and I mean almost any American of any economic uh, status at all, is living in a way that a Renaissance prince could not have imagined with plumbing and television. You want to hear the Berlin Philharmonic? Flip it on. You know, you want to see a baseball game 3,000 miles away? Turn on your TV. I mean, it's unbelievable, really. But there are still members of the church who are living in wretched conditions, as if they were medieval serfs. And so I think these chapters, these challenges that are offered to us are still, uh, still acutely important. But the point is, to me, it's crucial that this is all voluntary. It is not coercive. It's, uh, you know, I, I personally am, uh, am a communitarian at heart and uh, pretty much a libertarian in politics. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, someone might say, how in the world do you reconcile those? I find them absolutely easy to reconcile. Don't want my money taken from me, but I'm willing to give it. So anyway, just my little political edge there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so well, just just uh, uh, maybe I can finish off with Bryce no Bryce's notes. Um, there's a really important principle here too um, that goes along with what I was just saying. Uh, the saints were expected, but they weren't coerced to live this law. All could, some would, and some would not, uh, Professor Harper says. Um, but here's a nice story. Shortly after the revelation of Section 119 was given, Brigham Young, who was asked to go out and sort of evaluate economic conditions, what people could give, and so on, asked the Prophet Joseph, who shall be the judge of what is surplus property? And said Joseph, let them be the judges themselves. But it was really up to them. There's no code. Nobody's going to come out and say, hey, you know, you haven't given enough. Give us more. That's between the individual saint, the individual consecrator, and the Lord. Um, but the more we live the law of consecration, the more we understand the gospel, the more we'll want to help other people and, and do those sorts of things. Um, so uh, Professor Harper argues anyway that uh, there's no great discrepancy between what the Lord expects of the saints today and what he originally commanded in section 42 or the later amendment in section 119. Um, it, it, section 119 is a restatement of the law of consecration, sets the terms by which we can live the law today. And then Bryce's notes, uh, sorry I'm not doing as good a job Bryce as you could have done, but uh, a profound promise was made by President Hinckley to those saints who are obedient to the law of tithing. In 1998, speaking to the saints in Central America who just suffered tremendous destruction from Hurricane Mitch, President Hinckley taught that if they would pay their tithing, they would always have food on their tables. They would always have clothing on their backs. They would always have a roof over their heads. Um, and uh, that's from a talk given by uh, Lynn Robbins. It's, an, uh, it's a conference talk, I believe, published in the Ensign in May 2005 called Tithing, a Commandment Even for the Destitute. Um, that I've heard some people criticize the church and say the church wants to extract money even from the poor, but it's not the church. And um, it's a wonderful story about uh, Heber J. Grant's mother, Rachel Grant, I believe, um, who was told by her well-meaning bishop, "Look, you're so poor, uh, you don't need to pay tithing." And she was furious with him because he was trying to deprive her of the blessings that she would get by paying tithing. Very faithful attitude, but there's a lot of truth to it. Um, so it's it's still very much back to that idea of Malachi 3.10, that if you will pay tithing faithfully, the Lord will open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, I don't think that means everybody will be rich. I don't think that blessing is always material. Though the blessing that we'll, we'll never starve, we'll never be without a roof over our heads, we'll never go unclothed if we're faithful members of the church and pay our tithes. That I believe to be fully true. The blessings that may be poured out of the windows of heaven may be material. They certainly will be spiritual. Um, 
And I think many faithful tithe payers over the past nearly 200 years can testify to that. Mike, did you have additional things to say yeah. about 119? Yeah, just you, you brought up the the subject of the definition of surplus, um, and that has carried forward to the day in questions about the definition of tithing. Uh, and the first presidency has actually been very clear on this for at least the last 40 years or so. They issued a statement in 1970, and it has continued to be published on a regular basis, including in the current uh, leadership handbooks. If I can just quote from that briefly, the 1970 statement said, For your guidance in this matter, please be advised that we have uniformly replied that the simplest statement we know of is that statement of the Lord himself that members of the church should pay one-tenth of all their interest annually, which is understood to mean income. So the First Presidency interprets interest to mean income. And then they continue, No one is justified in making any other statement than this. We feel that every member of the church should be entitled to make his own decision as to what he thinks he owes the Lord and to make payment accordingly. So just like consecration is an individual application, tithing is that too. And there's no one who can judge you except for you and you're accountable to the Lord. Now you're going to sit down in front of the bishop once a year and declare your tithing status. You're a full-time payer, full-tithe payer, part-tithe payer, etc. But the bishop is not going to ask for your tax returns. He's not going to ask for any statement of, he's not going to ask for pay stubs or anything like that. If you go in and you've paid $10 and you declare yourself a full-tithe payer, he's going to accept that. Now, you have to answer to the Lord for that eventually. Uh, so clearly you want to be honest. Um, there's a, a quote from Joseph F. Smith on this. Uh, it's rather lengthy, but there's a, a small portion of it that I really like where he spoke on this issue. Uh, and he said, you are at liberty to do as you please in regard to this matter. You can choose whichever course you wish. But let me say to you that as we measure out, so it will be measured back unto us again. When we go to dickering with the Lord, he will probably dicker with us. And if he undertakes to do so, we shall get the worst of it. I think that we had better be honest with the Lord and deal justly and liberally with him. And he concludes a little bit further down, it is the heart and the willing mind that the Lord requires of his people, and not so much their substance. He, the Lord, does not need our obedience, but we need to be obedient, for it is through obedience that we will receive the reward. I, I find that quote to be very, very interesting because it puts the onus on us to do what is right for us, and not to say, well, the Lord said this, so I better do that, or my bishop said this, I better do that. It's up to me to decide what is the best course of action and to be honest and forthright and then to go forward with a pure conscience. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful quote. Um, you know, I, I served as a bishop for a while and uh, I presided over a, a relatively unaffluent uh, singles ward adjacent to Utah Valley University. There were many people in that ward to whom I gave temple recommends or, or whom I certified as full tithe payers who'd paid nothing because they had no income. Mm. It's not about the amount of money that's given. If your income for the year was zero, then zero is a full tithe. The question is your attitude. Of course, if you made 10 cents, you, you owe a penny. If you made 10 bucks, you owe a dollar. Um, but it's not the amount. So I've talked to some critics who've said, well, you know, uh, you have to pay to get the blessings of the temple. You have to pay to get in, you know. Actually, no, you don't. You have to be willing to sacrifice for the Lord. But there's no amount that you have to pay. It's not like you have to buy a ticket. You don't. Uh, zero is enough if if that's all you owe. Um, all and struck the blessings, is, I might say, the blessings that are available in there are available equally to everyone. When you go sit down in the temple for an endowment session, you're going to find the janitor sitting down next to the CEO and right. they're both dressed exactly alike and you don't know which is which because it doesn't matter. That's right. That's right. The other thing I liked about it was what you've already alluded to, which is the fact that uh, we don't do an inquiry, we don't do an inquest, we don't investigate, we don't demand, though I've heard silly stories about bishops demanding the tax forms be brought in. You know, I just don't believe it. I, I, it's, I, as far as I know, I never checked because it never came up in my ward. don't have the handbook anymore. I can't check, but I can't imagine that that's legit. Um, 
that a bishop would ever do that or could ever do that because all we're asked to do is ask, are you a full tithe payer? And if the person certifies, yes, I am, then that's it. As far as we're concerned, they're full tithe payers. It's between them and the Lord, really. If they want to lie to a bishop, that's up to them. But we take their word for it. And um, so there's no, uh, there's no church IRS or anything of that kind. Now, <laughs> I wanted to say one other thing about this, which is you know, be, having been a bishop, there was something else that impressed me, which was um, the fast offering funds are usually collected and administered locally. Uh, now, if a ward is exceptionally needy, uh, it will be supplemented from the stake and then from the church funds for fast offering expenditures. But, uh, but to a large extent, they're kept pretty close to home. Um, and so I used to make the point to, I mean, we sent them all in, but... but uh, we were trying to cover our own expenses. I always tried to make the point to uh, to people that came into me for fast offering assistance, not wanting to make them feel guilty, not at all. Um, but always remember that uh, the people are sacrificing. This money isn't coming to you from the church. There is no such thing as the church. These are faithful Latter Day Saints who are going without things to help you out. I had a few cases with people who they weren't bad people, but but who I think misunderstood a little bit. And when I heard that. So I was helping them with their rent or whatever. They were, uh, they were then going out every night to eat. When I found out about that, I said, "Look, the people who are sacrificing for this are not going out to a restaurant every night, and they're going without food, not to support you and your restaurant habit. You know, be responsible about this. The object is not to keep us in a luxurious lifestyle or being able to dine out on the town every night. It's designed to keep us from going hungry, from." being unclothed, to keep us from being out on the street. But um, the bishop is under an obli obligation to, to treat these funds as sacred funds, that they've been given by people who are sacrificing. And uh, he should be responsible, and so too the people who accept them. Not to m put any guilt trip on them or anything like that, but just that uh, they should understand that people are sacrificing to help them. So they may have to cut back a little bit in what they want too. Because everyone is is sacrificing here. Um, any other comments about principles of tithing and and fast offerings or fast uh, fasting? Um, the, I, I just yeah. wanted to add to this as far as an administrative uh, note. The next section, one hundred and twenty, dictates who's ultimately in charge of this money, uh, and it's done by revelation. It's not done by church policy. The revelation states that there is a council on the disposition of the tithes. Yes. That's composed of the first presidency and the bishopric, presiding bishopric, uh, the bishop and his two counselors. And then also the revelation says, by my high council, which refers to the traveling high council, which is the quorum of the twelve. Right. So those, um, I guess that would be 18 men, mm -hmm. are the ones who oversee this money and how it's going to be used. Yeah. And from everything I've heard about the meetings of that council still today, this is done with great uh, seriousness. Uh, they take it seriously because, well, the same reason I was already talking about. They know these are funds that have been contributed by sacrificing saints. And so they're not to be just tossed around lightly or anything like that. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important matter. That, um, and, and frankly, uh, <laughs> people who've served in bishoprics and as clerks know, one of the surest ways to get yourself into serious, serious trouble uh, with the church is to do anything illegitimate with, with church funds. It, N not because the church is greedy, but because this funds, these funds are sacred. It, it, it's a quick trip, isn't it? Uh, the, the outcome is decided on that one before the, the court is even held. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. But, you know, otherwise people can have no confidence when they give the money to the church that it will be used well if it's being siphoned off by a corrupt bishop or a corrupt clerk. That's just, that's scandalous. And when I've heard stories occasionally of, and I'm not trying to blacken the, the names of all preachers or anything like that, because I, I certainly think that uh, most of them are very sincere people, but, but there have been a few celebrated cases of, of uh, men particularly, not always men, who've taken in large sums of, of offerings from faithful people seeking a blessing, and then used it to buy yachts and, you know, multiple houses and so on. This, there's just something uniquely disgusting about that, in my view. Uh, trafficking on the, uh, on the faith of, of good people 
and exploiting them in that way. Something else that might be worth discussing is what the church does with this money because there's there's quite a bit of talk in uh, in the media about uh, how wealthy quote unquote the church is and and so forth and anybody who's aware of at least some, what the church does with some of their funds knows that they do use their money to purchase uh, land for example uh, land is a reasonably good investment um, that the church also operates farms and other facilities uh, obviously the money goes for the upkeep of uh, meeting houses and temples and if you've ever been a stake physical facilities representative you know what an ongoing cost that is and what a huge headache it is for every single spilled juice stain from a Cub Scout event that has to, carpet has to be replaced and so forth or an air conditioner goes out. Um, one thing that the church did recently that uh, has received quite a bit of, uh, uh, I hate to use the word grief, but yeah that's probably the right word is grief, is is invest quite a bit of money in, in building a mall in Salt Lake City, the City Creek Mall, uh, which is just across from Temple Square. And I think that, that the criticism on that has been very misguided because the church has an obligation to keep Salt Lake City a nice place to visit where the Salt Lake Temple is surrounded by pleasant places that are not uh, slummy, that are not run down, where there's not high crime. Uh, and so if you go to many large cities in the United States, Detroit as an example, or Philadelphia, where you've just seen the inner city completely run down, or there are some cities where uh, the local government or sometimes the state has spent a huge sum of money to try and renovate and, and bring the city back to a livable standard and, and sometimes with varying degrees of success, I think the church's view use there of those funds, and I don't know if they use tithing or whether they used income from other sources, to build that mall makes perfect sense. Yeah. This is a long-term investment in, in a healthy, thriving, good place to visit right across the street from Temple Square, uh, which is of course the number one tourist attraction in uh, for the church and, and probably for Utah as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's my understanding that uh, the church didn't use any tithing funds to fund the development of the City Creek Center. Um, I think they actually uh, printed that in in the Desert News that no no tithing funds were used. It was all from yeah. business uh, components of the church. Yeah, yeah, that's my understanding too. And uh, you know, but we've we've invested in comparable things on a much lesser scale. For a long, long time, I mean, the Nauvoo Mansion and so on. There were, there were, and the the Hotel Utah in its glory days. You know, the church was interested in building, building places that would attract visitors to, uh, to its headquarters, to, you know, to contemplate the glory of Zion, as we used to say, and to learn more about us and and so on. So, um, uh, so in a way, the mall and and things like that are just a continuation of something we've always been doing. Um, since uh, since the early 19th century, uh, when we could do it, when we could afford to do it. So, well, um, is there anything else we want to say? Because I think we've about uh, reached our time limit here. We try to keep these things from going on so long that uh, that we put people to sleep. I, I think I've quoted before, maybe not on these roundtables, my favorite definition of the uh, of the term professor, which is someone who talks in other people's sleep. And uh, we we don't want to be that quite so. Uh, so I want to thank uh, uh, Ben McGuire, Bryce Haymond, and uh, Mike Parker, and uh, and our listeners for participating in this with us. And uh, and we look forward to discussing future sections of the Doctrine and Covenants and more elements of church history as the year goes on. Thank you very much.